can't make any puddle argument for that. I came across a clip on Christian apologist Frank Turek's YouTube channel recently, and it impressed me. Not with how well done it was, but with how many fallacies and misdirections it contained in just three minutes. It's a work of mastery, really. Turek is a professional apologist, and in my opinion, he represents his ilk very well. He's articulate, charismatic, rather ignorant of basic science, and above all, loyal to defending his narrative regardless of what dishonesty that necessitates. This clip revolves around what Turek thinks of Douglas Adams' puddle analogy as a response to arguments for intelligent design, like the teleological argument. Eventually, Turek poses a question and says that if atheists can answer it, it'll do away with his own argument argument for good. If you don't know what the puddle analogy is, don't worry, we'll get to that. For context though, let's play a little bit of the clip first. Sometimes I run into this uh, question or this argument against the teleological argument, which would be the puddle argument, Yeah. which claims that the teleological argument, even though it has specifications that, sh that ultimately lead up to human life, it seems that um, through this, the puddle argument, it's more like it's just an appeal to pathos than it really is to any right, logic. Alright, explain what you mean by the puddle argument. To be clear, this guy doesn't explain the puddle analogy well. It's also hard to tell whether he's saying that the puddle analogy implies that teleological argument is an appeal to pathos or emotion, or that the puddle analogy itself is an appeal to pathos. I'll explain my thoughts on both ideas with one statement. I don't think the puddle analogy implies that about the teleological argument or appeals to pathos itself. It simply proposes another possible solution to the question of why our environment suits us and appears finely tuned for us. We'll get to a full explanation of the analogy, hang with me. I just want you to hear Turek's explanation and Douglas Adams' explanation side by side. Well, I think if I understand the puddle argument, they're saying that um, the reason there's a puddle there is there's a hole in the ground and it's filled with water and that's just the way it is and we're kind of the same way. Yeah, so Turek explained this pretty poorly, already essentially misrepresenting the analogy as simplistic and thoughtless. There's much more to be said of the analogy than Turek allows, so here's Douglas Adams delivering it himself. A puddle wakes up one morning and thinks, this is a very interesting world I find myself in. It fits me very neatly. In fact, it fits me so neatly. I mean, really precise, isn't it? <laughs> it must have been made to have me in it. Pretty different when explained properly, huh? It would have been respectable if Turek actually correctly represented the analogy, but as you'll see, honesty is not exactly easy for Turek. Where it's kind of like what we're doing is we see a target, we see a, an arrow in the wall, and we go up and draw a bullseye around it. Yeah. Actually, yes, I would say that's a good way to describe what Turk and the intelligent design crowd do. As he continues, I think you'll see why. Okay. Well, I don't think that works for a number of reasons. One reason, obviously, is the universe had a beginning, and secondly, a fine-tuned beginning. And you can't make any puddle argument for that, because nothing exists until the universe exists, nothing, nothing made of molecules anyway, and it, it's precisely fine-tuned. If it were changed any way, slightly, any one of those factors, slightly, nothing would exist or nothing livable would exist. So what Turek did here is just say, that's not what I'm doing, and then just restate the teleological argument. He doesn't even contend with the puddle analogy. In case you're wondering, this statement that the universe had a beginning or that the nature of the cosmos is such that it allows for life as we know it to exist is no problem for the puddle analogy. The analogy just shifts perspectives, presenting the possibility that the universe existed first and that we, in our evolution, came to exist as a creature which fits its pre-existing environment. Very simply put, it entertains the thought that we are a result of adaptation to our environment rather than asserting that the environment was built specifically to accommodate the capabilities and limitations of humans. Given that the fossil record demonstrates that modern humans have been around for a couple hundred thousand years at most, and radiometric dating of ancient rock formations like zircon crystals show Earth to be over four billion years old, I think it's worth entertaining the idea that we adapted to what was already here. Getting back to Turek, it's pretty obvious that he's heard all this before, so what I have to conclude is that Turek has either heard this repeatedly and still doesn't understand it, 
or that he understands this argument, can't properly refute it, and chooses to restate his previous argument in hopes of distracting everyone away from the point he can't refute. Now, I highly doubt that Turek is actually unintelligent enough to not understand the puddle analogy. So that leaves the other possibility that Turek is dishonest. Okay, so there appears to be intelligence behind the universe. Turek can state this all he wants, but the universe's intuitive appearance to anyone means nothing until they can demonstrate that there is intelligence behind the universe. Again, Turek just restates a talking point that doesn't contend with the puddle analogy because he can't contend with the puddle analogy. The analogy directly acknowledges that the universe appears designed, and it poses an explanation for why that appearance is deceiving. Secondly, the genome that we mentioned earlier, the 3.2 billion letter genome is like a software program. You could compare genetic sequences to binary code. Sure, there are certainly similarities there. Does that demonstrate that there is intelligence behind genetic sequences though? No, this point is intuitive and that may be convincing to some, but it ultimately proves nothing. Show me the supernatural design process of its creation. Show me its creator directly. If you can't, asserting that it was designed is unjustifiable. If you're walking along the beach and you see in the sand, John loves Mary, you don't go, gee, the waves made that, or the crabs came out of the water and made that message in the sand, right? You know immediately that that message must be the product of a mind. I can't believe that people are still unironically using this analogy. This material is ancient, and it's just a permutation of William Paley's centuries-old watchmaker analogy. In short, this argument is flawed because it's a false analogy. It implies that because two things, the letters in the sand and DNA, share one quality, complexity, that they must share another quality, design. This is logically fallacious. They don't have to share another quality. I've linked a video from Rationality Rules in the description which debunks this further. What Turek doesn't state here is that while letters in the sand have been proven to be products of human creation, DNA has been shown to grow and change naturally without any observed creator. All, in all our prior experience, messages always come from minds. Messages are a product of the mind, but not in the way Turek thinks. Things which are perceived as messages don't require an intelligent creator, they only require an intelligent interpreter. An event, a sound, a physical object, does not have to be intended as a message to be perceived as one. More on that later. Now that's just a few letters long, or a couple of words long, but imagine a message 3.2 billion letters long in every one of our cells. If John Loves Mary requires a message, a messenger, a mind, then a software program 3.2 billion letters long also seems to require a mind, a great mind, to create. Again, this argument from complexity is fallacious. I've done all I need to do to refute it in this video already, but seriously, if you want to hear it taken down in even greater depth, go watch the Rationality Rules video I've linked in the description. And look, atheists can get rid of the argument from information in DNA by simply answering this question. What natural laws can create messages? This is really easy, actually. Again, messages require only an interpreter to exist. If I gave an example of a perceived message existing but then being shown to be caused by natural forces, would that satisfy this question? It would, right? Okay, then I'll cite multiple examples. In 1976, NASA's Viking 1 spacecraft orbited Mars and took a photo of its surface, which revealed a rock structure that appeared just like a humanoid face. NASA released the photo to the public, and many saw it as an intelligently created structure meant to convey some artistic meaning or a signal to humans on behalf of Martians. When Mars Global Surveyor photographed the same structure again in 1998 with a much better camera, the formation was shown to be a natural formation with no features of a face. The appearance of a face was the result of shadowing and a low-resolution camera. Nature communicated a message without intent. On May 28, 585 BC, the Medes and Lydians battled in what is now Turkey. The battle ended and both sides agreed to a truce when the soldiers saw a solar eclipse. They interpreted the event as an omen from the gods, a sign that the gods did not condone the battle. Now we know that eclipses are natural phenomena easily forecasted by the predictable orbits of the moon and earth. Nature communicated a message without intent. 
In July 1967, astronomer Jocelyn Bell noticed regular, well-defined pulses of radio waves coming from a small patch of the sky. No natural source had ever been shown to produce such a signal, as it bore striking resemblance to man-made radio broadcasts. Bell humorously called the source of the pulses Little Green Men 1, or LGM-1, as it appeared to be an attempt at communication from alien life forms. In other words, a message. People buzz with excitement about receiving a message from extraterrestrials. With further study, though, Bell found several more sources of similar radio pulses in the sky. Astrophysicist Thomas Gold then found that the pulses were just a result of rapidly rotating neutron stars. They were given the name pulsars. Nature communicated a message without intent. I could keep going, but do you see my point? Those occurrences were all taken as messages by large numbers of people at some point. Their existence has been explained, however, by natural forces. Now that I've answered that question, will Turk get rid of the argument from DNA, as he calls it? I hope so, because it's awful. There's only four known natural forces. Gravity, the strong and weak nuclear forces, and electromagnetism. Light. Which one of those four, or combination thereof, can create a software program? Well, just for good measure, let's dive into the science that explained how the laws of nature create DNA. Keep in mind, this stuff is a simple Google search away. Turek, however, has been trying to answer the question of where DNA came from with nothing but theology, when the answer has been within the field of biology all along. DNA naturally replicates in the production of a new life form. In this process, most of its structure is copied perfectly, but there are often mistakes made, such as imperfect duplicate copies of certain base pairs. Imperfect copies of previous organisms' DNA can lead to differences in gene expression within the larger organism. Some of these mutations can prove beneficial in helping the organism survive longer and produce more offspring. Then, those beneficial mutations are passed on to more offspring than differently mutated genes, and preserved in future generations. DNA sometimes adds new genes to itself without any intent. Over a long enough period of time, DNA can change from rather short and simple to extremely long and complex. We directly observe this happening, even today. If you want to get more in-depth on this, there are links in the description which will help you learn more. So, Turek's smoking gun for intelligent design is a feature of the universe that's been studied so in-depth that we know very well just how it forms and changes naturally. Turek doesn't understand how DNA formed. It looks complicated and impressive to him, so he settles with the answer of, God just made it, rather than studying the readily accessible scientific resources on the subject, or simply being honest and humble in saying, I don't know. In fact, this entire argument comes down to, I can't explain that naturalistically, so that proves God did it. There's something that hasn't been explained, so God is invoked to fill that gap in our understanding. That's what's called arguing for a god of the gaps. It's a well-recognized fallacy, and one which Turek knows about. How do I know he knows it? You'll see how in the ironic twist that is the ending of Turek's answer. The answer is none of them. And if they're going to say, well, one day we'll figure that out, I call that faith. Here's the first part of the irony. He accuses atheists of having faith, implying that's a bad thing. Meanwhile, he bases his whole life and career on the idea that faith is a reliable way to obtain truth and should be encouraged. Why is it bad for atheists to have faith, but it's totally okay for Christians to? That's blatant and laughable hypocrisy. To be clear, I don't think that faith is a reliable path to truth, and I strongly discourage its belief or invocation. Still, this guy, once again, is too dense to understand this hypocrisy or is too dishonest to recognize it and I don't think he's too dense. This is so manipulative of his impressionable audience. It's gross. <laughs> That's called natural law of the gaps. Here's where the real irony comes in. Turek bases his whole argument on naturalism hasn't explained it, so God must have done it, while poking fun at the natural law of the gaps fallacy. Here's the thing, Turek. One, DNA can and has been explained naturalistically. You just don't know that because you're scientifically illiterate. Two, the difference between you, a Christian, and myself, an atheist, is that when we see something that we can't explain, you say, God did it, and I say, I don't know. 
I don't ask that anyone assert that naturalism can explain everything. All I ask is that when you don't know something, don't make up an unproven explanation so that you don't have to admit that you don't know. Just admit ignorance and then research it from there. That's the basis of intellectual honesty, and I hope the viewers of this video hold to that themselves. I have really little hope for Turek, though, because as we've seen here, honesty is not his strong suit. Thanks for watching. I've been Drew of Genetically Modified Skeptic. As always, go ahead and subscribe, check out my Patreon, follow me on Twitter and Facebook at GM Skeptic, join my Discord, and until next time, stay skeptical.